I bring you greetings, and I'm very glad to be able to be a part of the uh, renewal this year. And uh, my wife is with me, and she has appreciated it very much also. We came here thirsty, and our thirst is being assuaged. And I can't even take credit for thinking that up. My wife said that uh, this morning on the road down from Maryville. But uh, we, I, I believe that is our experience. I share that with her, and we're, we're very glad. I want to thank God for the faithful men that have been doing the preaching so far and look forward to the rest of today and, and tomorrow. Turn with me in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 1, please. Second Peter chapter 1, I'm only going to read two verses from there, and there will be a lot of other scripture to consult in the next several minutes. First, excuse me, Second Peter chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, that word quite possibly could mean of any private origin. Amen. For prophecy never came by the will of man, for holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, right off the bat, I'll tell you one thing that I have come to know. The longer I live and the longer I read the Bible, the more I am convinced that no mere man or group of men could have thought up this book. Amen. Amen. I can't conceive of how that could have been done. It is so palpably different from the other religious books of mankind as far as I know. It is so entirely original in its literary diversity, its doctrinal unity, it is so entirely original in its transparent honesty in reporting the failures of its heroes, its brilliant conciseness, its main doctrine of salvation by grace through faith, which no man would have ever thought up. Well, as far as I know, there's no book like this book. It is alone entirely on the face of the earth. And if this book did not originate with man, then whose idea was it? And where did it come from? Somebody wrote that same idea in this little poem. Where but from heaven could men unskilled in arts in several ages, born in several parts, weave such agreeing truths? Or how or why should all conspire to cheat us with a lie? Unasked their pains, ungrateful their advice, starving their gains, and martyrdom their price. Where indeed but from heaven? But my topic this afternoon is the spiritual role in bringing the scriptures into being. In other words, the inspiration of the holy scriptures. A lot of good work has been done by faithful men in that area. And I want to make some preliminary marks about the doctrine of inspiration, some preliminary remarks before we get more directly into scripture study here in just a few minutes. Perhaps one of the best studies that has been done in that area is an article written by B.B. Warfield in the, in the International Standard Biblical Encyclopedia. Now he wrote that article early in this century, but it was so good and so complete that even though that, that encyclopedia has been revised several times, they just leave his article in it. They've never replaced it. His article is in the current edition of the ISB that maybe some of you have in your libraries. I won't do much of this this afternoon, but permit me to quote one paragraph from his 12-page double-column article. And he says this about the books and the writers of the Bible. 
The Bible books are called inspired as the divinely determined products of inspired men. The Bible writers are called inspired as breathed into by the Holy Spirit so that the product of their activities transcends human powers and becomes divinely authoritative. Inspiration is therefore usually defined as a supernatural influence exerted on sacred writers by the Spirit of God by virtue of which their writings are given divine trustworthiness. Now, Warfield in his article says that, he, he says that, those are his words, and he says this is true as far as it goes. But there's more to say, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Now, this, I want to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in giving us the scriptures. You know from your study of the word that the Spirit of God has several roles to perform. And several of those roles have been pointed out to us in the, the course of the conference so far. We know that the Holy Spirit has a role of being the convictor of sin and of truth and of judgment. The, the Holy Spirit has the role of being the comforter of God's people in their times of distress. The Holy Spirit has a role of being the guide of God's people. As Brother Ken said last night, the Holy Spirit is also the revealer. And it's in that particular role that I am to uh, address the topic of the Holy Spirit in giving the scriptures. And there are so many scriptures that speak of this role of the Spirit that it actually took me one page of typing paper just to list them. Now, that's not writing them out. That's just listing the scripture references on a piece of notebook paper. It took the whole page, and I'm sure I didn't get all of them on that page. Don't worry, we're not going to uh, look at all of them, the rest of you speakers. Uh, I'm not going to take the entire afternoon. Both testaments, old and new, speak very clearly of the, of the Spirit of God speaking revealing and teaching God's word to God's penmen so that what they wrote down and we call Holy Scripture is the word of God. I'll give you just a smattering from the Old Testament. You might consider 2 Samuel 23 and verse, 12, uh, verse 2 as one example. This is David speaking in 2 Samuel 22, verse, 23 verse 2 where David says, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. So David says that he is God's spokesman, God's penman, because the Holy Spirit is working through him and is on his tongue. You might also consider Nehemiah chapter 9, and that ninth chapter of Nehemiah is that man's great, uh, great prayer of confession. The people of Israel had returned from exile to the land, and Nehemiah is their leader. And in that prayer, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20, he addresses these words to the Lord. He says, you gave your good spirit to instruct them, and did not withhold your manna from their mouth. Your manna, your word, the bread from heaven. It came through your spirit. You gave them your spirit as their instructor. The result was they got manna. They got your word. And also in that same prayer, Nehemiah 9 verse 30, that verse speaks of this God's spirit testifying to the people through the prophets. Well, over in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21, God is speaking to Isaiah the prophet. And he says this to Isaiah. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth. 
In other words, to Isaiah, the message that you have is from me. I have put my spirit upon you. The result of my spirit being upon you is the words of your mouth. The prophecies that you will speak forth and you will write down as my sacred penman. So the spirit, you see, is producing what we call the holy scriptures through the mouths of his chosen servants. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, another prophet gives an interesting verse on that. He says, Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Amen. Now, that doesn't mention the Holy Spirit, but it talks about God revealing his secrets to the prophets. We know from the other scriptures we've read so far, this is nothing less than the work of the Spirit of God himself. Now that's just a smattering from the Old Testament. However, as the New Testament is a fuller revelation of the things of God, the bulk of our information this afternoon will come from there. The New Testament reaffirms what the Old Testament had previously said about this, but it adds much more. For instance, consider Acts chapter 1 and verse 16. Now there the Apostle Peter is speaking. And here's what he says. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Did you get that? Peter is reaffirming and adding more and expanding this doctrine there in Acts 1.16. The Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David. Peter says that's right. That wasn't just David talking. That was the Holy Spirit speaking through the mouth of his chosen servant. Amen. And everywhere and in every part the Bible claims to be a written revelation of God through his spirit. If the Bible didn't make that claim, I wouldn't be up here preaching about this this afternoon, and it wouldn't even be a topic on our uh, agenda of topics for the conference this year. But the fact is that people that know their Bibles know that the Bible makes that claim. Yes. It claims to be revelation from God through the Holy Spirit. Yes. And it does so not just in one isolated verse. It's not just here... Uh, over here in this book, but you can't find it uh, back here in this part of the Bible. It is completely through the scriptures. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation where we're constantly told, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The Bible writers themselves seem to have no question about this whatsoever. They, they seem to have a consciousness that they are spokesmen for God and nothing less. In Romans chapter 3, for instance, in verse 2, the Apostle Paul speaks of the Old Testament as being the oracles of God. Nothing less than the oracles of God. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, the Apostle Peter says this. He says, if anyone speaks in the church, he, I added that, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, he's saying, preacher, be sure that what you are preaching is thus saith the Lord. And then don't hold back. If you know it's thus saith the Lord, don't you dare hold back. Speak as the oracles of God. Well, now we, uh, I want to look at what I would call some of the main New Testament scriptures on this topic of the Spirit's role in giving us the scriptures. In Acts chapter 28 and verse 25, Paul says this, The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers. So there you have it again. First Peter affirms in Acts 1 that David was given his message from the Holy Spirit. Now Paul at the end of the book of Acts in chapter 28 
affirms that Isaiah the prophet didn't make up his message. It didn't originate with him. The Holy Spirit spoke through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers. And that brings us to really one of the two big ones, one of the two main ones as far as this teaching goes, and that is the one we already read, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Where Peter says, talking about where, where did prophecy originate, the prophetic scriptures, and of course that would apply to all of the word of God, prophecy never came by the will of man. It did not originate with man. That's why this book is so different. That's why there's nothing like it on the face of the earth, because no man thought it up. One of our, one of our brethren reminded us, talking about a, a different phase of God's revelation, we didn't call it down from heaven, we didn't dig it up out of the ground. It was sent down from heaven, but we didn't call it down. God, God gave that to men on earth, but it's manna from heaven. And Peter says, prophecy never came of the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The NIV says, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried along. That same word is used over in the book of Acts describing a ship with the wind blowing against the sails of the ship and carrying the ship along. There's a difference. It's not a perfect illustration because the ship is passive. And the pen men of God were not passive. Amen. Yes. And that's one point I want to make about this. And that is that in the production of the Holy Scriptures, God did use holy men. Amen. So they were not machines. They were not robots. They were not typewriters. But they were willing and available and holy men of God Amen. who wanted to be used by God in this way. They wanted to serve and they made themselves available. They yielded to God's Spirit. And then secondly, they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit in what they delivered as the mind or will of God. They didn't think it up. The Holy Spirit gave it to them, revealed it to them, and carried them along. And Matthew Henry, I got a little quote from Matthew Henry here. He, he kind of looks at that verse and he makes this summary. The very words of Scripture are to be accounted the words of the Holy Ghost proceeding from God. That is clearly what Peter is teaching in 2 Peter chapter 1, and it goes along with all of the other teaching of Scripture. Turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And of course, our topics do overlap somewhat, and I, I find that interesting. I'm looking, always looking for insights for my own message as these other men are preaching. So I cheat a little bit and I take down some notes and maybe I can use them. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't wait till I got here to say, well, I'll put my message together as these other men are preaching. But every now and then I'm hoping for a little insight. And these brethren are uh, so faithful to the word, God uses them and they, I get some insight that way. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, um, verse verses 12 and 13, where the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, did you get that one line in there? We teach not with words of man's wisdom, but that words which the Holy Spirit teaches. You could go back up to verse 10 also, 
God has revealed them to us, talking about sacred spiritual truths, God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. So, when you read the, the letters of, of the New Testament, and you're reading letters from Paul, letters from John, letters from Peter, I've run into this before, maybe you have too. I, I've quoted a scripture to someone, and said, that's just the word of man. That's just Peter. Oh, that's just Paul, he was just a man. Well, all of these men took the view in complete unity with one another and in complete support of one another that they were not just writing as men. They were writing as the oracles of God. They were God's penmen so that the result is God's word, the Holy Scriptures. Another area of the New Testament from which we can gather some data for this, this teaching is in the Upper Room Discourse in the Gospel of John. Now in John 13 through 17, it's called the Upper Room Discourse because it starts out in the Upper Room in Jerusalem and it was the night before Jesus was given that false trial and crucified. And in that upper room, it didn't end up in the upper room, they ended up in the Garden of Gethsemane. But they started out in the upper room, and it seems to be all one body of teaching there, continuous teaching, John 13 through 17. And one of our brethren, this morning I think it was, spoke to the fact that the time was right for the Lord on that occasion it was right and it was needful very needful for the Lord on that occasion realizing what was about to transpire in the next few hours and the spiritual condition his disciples would be in at the end of all of that it was very needful for him to teach them about the work of the Holy Spirit and there's a lot of that teaching in that upper room discourse. Now, if you'll turn with me to John 14 and verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. Now, he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the men that have been with him. But in verse 26 he says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now didn't you ever wonder as you read your New Testament where, especially the four, what we call the four Gospels, they, they were written some you know, 30, 40, 50 years later after these things happened, how did they remember all of that? I can't remember things that happened 30 years ago, let alone verbatim reports of sermons I've heard or, or things like that. I might remember an impression that was made upon me, but to remember the very words? Well, how did they remember? Well, the Lord is telling them here that He is going to send the Spirit and the Spirit will work in them to such a degree that they will be able to remember. They'll be able to call to mind the things that happened. You see, they won't totally have forgotten these things, of course. I mean, they spent three years with our Lord Jesus Christ, being taught by Him, seeing the miracles, hearing His powerful teaching. They wouldn't forget it all, but, but, but it would be a little fuzzy. And he's saying, don't worry, the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send him to take care of that. He'll remind you precisely in detail what you need to know to write down accurate, faith-producing reports Amen. of what happened. Amen. And then over in chapter 16, we're in the same discourse. At this point, they've moved out of the upper room crossing the Kidron Valley on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. But in chapter 16, verses 12 through 14, 
The Lord says to the disciples there, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it unto you. Very, very similar kind of teaching that the Lord had just given in what we call chapter 15 of the Upper Room Discourse. In other words, the Holy Spirit will take the things that have happened. He'll remind you of those things. Things that haven't happened yet but are things to come. He will teach you about those things. And he'll take what is about me, and he'll reveal it to you. Now, what's he, what's he saying here? Stop and think for just a minute. He's obviously saying this is where the New Testament will come from. Because who wrote the New Testament? Apostles and evangelists. And they were, by and large, men who were either with the Lord or saw the risen Lord such as the Apostle Paul, later on. And this, what, what's happening here in, in chapter 15 and chapter 16 of John, just to kind of sum it up, Christ is pre-authorizing the New Testament. That's what he's doing. He's pre-authorizing the New Testament. So that, these, this isn't just Peter talking, it's not just John talking. It's not just Paul's opinion about something. It's revelation of God and of Christ through the Holy Spirit guiding these men. Well, then, of course, we have that great foundational scripture dealing with the inspiration of the Bible, and I'm referring to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 probably one of the first memory verses we all memorized as kids in Sunday school if we had that experience. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Now that verse does not speak directly of the Holy Spirit in giving scripture, but it comes very close. Now what do I mean by that? Since it didn't say anything about the Holy Spirit, how can it come close? Well, note, first of all, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to a preacher. He wants him to preach the Word. You don't preach all this other stuff. Preach the Word of God. Why? Because it's given, because, because it's given by God and is profitable for the people. So, he says, first of all, all scripture is given. Amen. Now that goes along with 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. It is something given to these men. And through them it is given to us. No group of men thought it up. The Bible is not man's idea. It is divinely given. Amen. Now that's what it claims through and through. Secondly, note... It's given by the inspiration of God. Now the original Greek word translated as inspiration of God here is the word theonoustos. You may or may not remember that. But the word literally means God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. Here again let me quote B.B. Warfield. He says, what it says of Scripture is not that it is breathed into by God. In other words, I've heard that explanation. Well, here's this Bible written by men, written by mere men. It's a dead book. It just lays there. And God's Spirit breathes into it and makes it inspiring. So that it's inspiring literature to read. That was the furthest thing from the mind of the Apostle Paul when he wrote this verse to young Timothy. So Warfield has already said that. He says, nor is it the product of divine inbreathing into the human authors. 
but it is breathed out by God. It is God breathed. It is the product of the creative breath of God. So he's talking about, again, the origin of Scripture. It's breathed out by God. It ends up coming through the pens of men as they write, but it's breathed out by God so that it's His Word. The English words breath and spirit translate the same Greek word pneuma. Now, I believe the work of God's Spirit is strongly alluded to here. Theonoustos. God, theo, God, we get theo, you know, theology. Theo, God, the Greek word for God. Pneuma, spirit. And although, although literally it means God breathed, I think it is parallel to the idea of the Spirit of God being the one that produces the Scripture. Now, as we get toward the close of what I'm talking about, I want to say a word about the mode of operation. There's a lot of talk about this, or at least there used to be a lot of debate, about people having theories of inspiration. Now, I don't claim to understand the Spirit's mode of operation in using free, willing, godly men to produce the Scriptures. I don't have a theory about it. I don't believe I could understand it. But I am convinced that somehow in his sovereign power and his infinite wisdom, the Spirit of God did so. And that what we have in this book, in my opinion, since it is God-breathed and produced by the Spirit of God, it's verbally inspired, it is absolutely trustworthy, it is the infallible and inerrant Word of God. Now if you say, preacher, I think you're starting to sound like a fundamentalist. I say, so be it. I don't know what else to sound like when I take this book up in my hands. Because I believe it's God's book. I believe the Holy Spirit inspired every line of it. Back in 1950, a liberal New Testament scholar named F.C. Grant wrote a book in which he said this, In the New Testament, it is everywhere taken for granted that Scripture is trustworthy, infallible, and inerrant. I shared that statement with my wife. She said, and he was a liberal? I said, yeah, yeah, he was a liberal. He felt free to recognize what the Bible teaches and then step back and disagree with it. In other words, he says, I see what it's teaching. The Bible everywhere teaches that it is the infallible and errant word of God. There's no doubt about it. That's what it teaches. But I don't have to accept that. I'm free to reject that. That's what he was saying. He felt that way. He felt like he was free to do that. But I don't. I don't. My soul salvation depends on the truth of this book. God has given me to see that this is the truest writing on the face of the earth. When I read this book, I'm not just reading about ancient people that lived a long time ago. I'm reading about myself. I'm reading... I'm the, I'm the sinner that this book's always talking about. I'm the sinner that needs the grace of God that this book's always talking about. I, I can't imagine how anybody could have the temerity to look at this book and say, well, it does claim to be God's book. It does claim to be the inerrant word of God. And then to step back and say, but I disagree with it. The, the temerity of a puny little man to come to statements like that. I can only tell you that I hear the Spirit of God speaking everywhere in the pages of this book.
I want to give you just some concluding exhortation. Knowing what the Bible says, for instance, we just read, just quoted you from this man that does that. Knowing what the Bible says but doing nothing about it is absolute spiritual disaster. As it was for the Israelites in the wilderness. I remind you of the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. Where it says of those Israelites in the wilderness, the word which they heard, they heard the word, they knew what it was, the word which they heard did not profit them, and we know they all perished in the wilderness. It did not profit them, why not? Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And how many people are there today, even in the churches, who hear the word of God and maybe can intellectually tell you, yes, I hear what it's saying, I know that's in there, but... And they don't mix it with faith. And they feel free to reject it. So my brethren, I would say to you this afternoon in closing, mix faith with what you find in God's book. Amen. Yes, by all means, study to handle it aright. Learn about literary context and historical context. Do all of that. But once you find the doctrine and your duty, do not remain passive or merely academic. Amen. Don't trifle around with the Word of God. Right. It's the Holy Spirit of God Himself speaking to you in every line. Amen. We cannot trifle around with God's Holy Scriptures. And expect to see the Lord in all of his beauty and glory, high and lifted up. Amen.